I have a wonderful panel uh, to elucidate the question of a fragile world from Cold War to hot peace. Um, starting in the line of um, uh, that's introduced in the program, Matthew Rodansky, uh, director at the Kennedy Institute at the Woodrow School, uh, Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. Julie Bichette, Global Force Planner, Office uh, of the Secretary of Defense of the United States. Elena Lazaru, Senior Policy Analyst uh, at the European Parliament Security Research Reser uh, Service. And Marion Vidauri, Section Chief, Political uh, Analysis Organization of American States. And finally, there's been a slight change from the original plan uh, program. I'm pleased to welcome Dr. Tanvi Madan, who is a director of India uh, analysis at the Brookings Institution. Welcome to you all. Uh, the topic that we have been asked to discuss here today is the tension that we see of a world that is at one side, uh, at one, on the one side, is growing increasingly interconnected, increasingly globalized, and at the same time, we see a, a rise of nationalism uh, that seems to span the globe in some ways. I'm sure the, the panelists will, will weigh in on this. For my own sake, um, I, find it, I find it interesting uh, that, uh, that nationalism, one of the more uh, powerful ideologies uh, in, in the modern world alongside the liberalism and socialism, uh, has uh, got such a, a bad reputation, particularly in the West. After all, nationalism created the modern world, it created the nation state. Uh, the world that in, uh, international affairs uh, are played out. And at the same time, nationalism has a very dark history uh, and it's, it's intimately connected to the legacy of the dark 1900s and the two world wars. I would like to, uh, to start with giving the floor to, uh, to, you, to you, Matthew. Um, would you weigh in a little bit on uh, uh, your field of expertise, Russia, and perhaps your, your home country, the United States? Okay, thanks very much, uh, Asa, and um, thanks for starting us right on time. Um, so I have to apologize up front. My uh, educational background is law, and so I've been taught to argue with every premise. Um, so I'll start with an apology and end with an apology, both about the same thing. Um, the, the part of the uh, panel description that I initially uh, thought to argue with uh, actually Asa didn't emphasize, and that's this idea that there's an important generational divide in uh, adopting certain views on nationalism or protectionism or populism versus globalism. Um, I think many of us on the panel kind of concluded, no, it doesn't feel uh, like that's the case, like it's generational. And that got me thinking uh, about, I think, the, the bigger problem in attributing uh, to any uh, one either group or uh, ideology, the sorts of uh, motivational challenges that we face in our society today. And, th and that's the, the challenge of false dichotomies. So whether it's youth versus an older generation, or whether it's even something like nationalism, populism, protectionism, versus some sort of idealized liberalist globalism, whatever, uh, that it seems to me is a false dichotomy. When I, when I, uh, and, and I would add to that, um, Asa, I think you got at this with your very good point about what nationalism means clearly, what it evidently means to Europeans. It means something. You say nationalism, boom, you're channeling the 1930s, you're channeling a very specific legacy and context. But that context isn't the same everywhere in the world. And so when we heard nationalism described uh, by an Indian official earlier today in one of the open sessions, uh, and we've heard it referenced by others uh, not coming from the European experience, it means something very different. So. Uh, be wary of false dichotomies and be aware of context. When I ask myself, uh, what is the deeper political, even maybe psychological, animating idea uh, behind a moment in which surprising things are happening in politics across the globe, um, what I find is it's actually just very fundamentally human. And this might be so simple as to be banal. Um, that is, it seems like most of the successful insurgent political ideas are basically about solving problems. Well, that's a very positive sounding message. We are going to solve your problems. Often there's a lot of negative baggage that goes with that. But essentially the promise is we're going to resolve development problems, security problems, problems of justice and injustice. And so the framing question for politics becomes can you solve problems? 
and not which side do you take in an abstract theoretical debate. And in this sense, speaking to the title of the panel, From Cold War to Hot Peace, what we lack is an obvious ideological debate that is all-consuming and global and purports to be universalist, like communism versus capitalism and liberal democracy. That is clearly not a useful framework for today. So if the animating question is, can you solve problems, now the important measures of that are basic efficacy, in other words, judge me by my results, um, transparency, accessibility, right? Can those who hold power be reached by the people who, on whose behalf they hold that power? Uh, and of course, accountability, right? Is there some mechanism for dealing with uh, those who go off the rails, uh, those who abuse their power? Um, unfortunately, and this is where I'll come to Russian and, and American examples, I think what complicates this uh, analysis is that each of those key measures is in the eye of the beholder. So in Russia, for example, uh, this is a context which many Americans are sort of endlessly, almost romantically critical of as the archetype of unaccountable, ineffective, uh, non-transparent governance. Actually, many Russians would answer each of those measures and say, well, in fact, Putin's government in Russia is all of those things. It's very effective. It's very accessible. After all, he has a call-in show where you can call and ask him to help you. Um, and at the end of the day, it's much more accountable than, than any other systems of Russian government we have seen up to now. And I think many Russians sincerely believe this. Uh, on the other hand, I think many Americans think that that's exactly backwards, but wouldn't necessarily think of our own government as having really severe problems in that respect. And yet, look at the 2016 presidential election. What was the most effective critique coming from the insurgent candidates, right? Inefficacy of government, inaccessibility of people in power, and lack of transparency. I can sketch it out for you in more detail, but better that I don't. I, th I think you all know what I'm talking about. Um, so if so much of this is in the eye of the beholder, what is it at the end of the day that can be said that is of universal applicability? And here's where I'll, I'll beg your forgiveness at the end of my remarks. I am a lawyer. So I think we need rules. You know, rules that mean, roughly speaking, the same thing to everyone on both sides of the transaction. Um, we need rules between parties, between individuals within a state society, and we need rules between states to manage differences of perception and context. But in forming rules, you have to balance. Of course, I come from uh, a common law tradition. The law is very flexible, very adaptable, and not a civil law tradition. But I recognize you need to balance between rules that you agree to in advance, that you write up in documents like constitutions or international conventions, and, and what I might call situational frameworks, a contract between individuals. Uh, or a treaty between nations, which recognizes, I was speaking with colleagues earlier today, that they have no choice because of the threats that they face, the challenges and the opportunities. They'd better cut a deal. But then the deal needs to mean the same thing to both sides. And so, and I'll end on this, I think that the challenge of a world of hot peace and indeed of one that is seeking enforcement of rules for effective solving problems is whether those who agree to the rules actually mean what they say. And so I think the challenge to come to the point about generations, which is not entirely irrelevant at the end of the day, is will this generation, will the rising generation represented by many people in this room, be a generation that is seen to be one of its word, a generation like so many generations that we respect in the past, that means what it says and that is good to its word. And I think this is a surprisingly important and surprisingly often ignored question about who we are. Just think about the last dinner party invitation you received where you said, yeah, maybe I'll come. And you maybe answered by text message or Facebook messenger or WhatsApp. Is it, in fact, a generation, the rising generation, that means what it says, says what it means, and can be trusted to enforce rules? Wonderful. And, uh, and also keeping within the time, time in the limits. Thank you very much, Matt. Uh, we will um, we will uh, go a little bit off uh, the the uh, the, uh, the the list now uh, as it uh, appears in the program and give the floor to Dr. Tandi Madam, who's um, a director at Brookings. Uh, Tandi, could you uh, perhaps uh, give us some views on uh, on India and perhaps even Asia on this question? Sure. And one of the things I was asked to do was also talk about kind of 
not just India, but kind of how, uh, on, a, on the broader subject of kind of does nationalism and protectionism, can it kind of affect interstate relations? And I was asked to use as an example, could it affect relations not between India and China, which I could probably talk about as well, but kind of the US and India, which you wouldn't necessarily think uh, would be something on the subject. First day, I was in April, I was asked to go and give a talk on US-India relations in Wichita, Kansas. Um, this is a state that voted uh, by 20 points for President Trump. And I was partly curious about why they wanted to hear about US-India relations. And this was a local, and when, when I reached there and I was talking to people, it came, to, it, it came up that local political, business, and civil society leaders who were at this talk were very worried about the impact of the killing of an Indian American engineer uh, in Kansas, not in v Wichita, but in a place called Alas, uh, close by. Not just for moral reasons, but a very economic one. They were worried about this because um, they were concerned that uh, the, in Wichita, in Kansas, uh, is a huge hub for the aviation sector. And since it's becoming increasingly high tech, uh, there are a number of Indian American techies who work there. And what they were concerned about was that suddenly Indian Americans or Indians would say, we don't want to go there uh, because, and we'd rather go to another state because we're concerned about safety uh, and identity politics issues and nationalism and, and questions linked to that. And the reason I mention this is I think this kind of shows how when we talk about these issues, they're kind of very real world stories where it's much more complicated than kind of either the young old red blue uh, state, um, you know, different countries, what they mean uh, by nationalism um, and issues of protectionism. So these things cut across uh, different lines. On the US India side, the story is also instructive in terms of how the two countries are connected and how potentially, if these issues get, if these kind of trends of nationalism uh, and protectionism kind of go in a certain direction, how it could potentially affect. U.S. and India relations, and, and in some cases, other interstate relations. There are arguably three drivers for U.S.-India relations. Um, strategic, essentially, the rise of China has created the context for the two countries. Economic, in terms of trade, investment, and immigration. Um, and values-based, diverse <coughs> democracies that share certain values uh, and have built people-to-people -people ties. Arguably, issues of nationalism, and I'm going to come to the point that it means different things in different uh, places, but economic nationalism and identity politics in both countries uh, can affect not just kind of the economic element. To give you an example, either it can affect immigration policies, for example, in the U.S. or in India, identity politics could lead to, for example, investors questioning foreign investors, American investors questioning whether this is really the place that they want to invest because it's too risky. It can affect kind of the economic. Uh, and values-based drivers, but it can arguably also, by making the countries more insular in some ways, um, affect kind of strategic uh, relations as well. It's important, I think, in terms of, and I think we've all talked about this in terms of the young old, uh, but I think where it's not a need, it's hard to generalize about whether this is kind of a, a young people turning against globalization or becoming more nationalistic. I think we all kind of question that. And I think when you see and you drill down, that's actually not proven by the data that young people are turning away from this. But the other place I think you can't generalize is across uh, regions. And I would say, for example, in Asia, you really do see uh, nationalism kind of coming out in a very different way. Nationalism in Asia has tended to be more in the form of kind of what you would consider kind of uh, re-emerging powers who are more confident. Now, that nationalism could be a good thing if it comes out as patriotism. But it could create problems if it comes out as a kind of more assertive nationalism as we're seeing. I think also on globalization, if you look around, where was the last kind of major anti-globalization protest in Asia? So we're at a stage now where you're seeing the anti-globalization protests in the, in the West, where here you saw them in the 90s in, in Asia. Um, and so I think these questions are becoming a little more complicated. But what do we do about it just very quickly? Um, I think particularly we were asked to say, what do you do about young people? Um, I apparently don't count as a young person anymore, so uh, uh, according to Samir Sarn's definition. So I would just say, I think one thing, uh, the point Matt made about at the end of the day, what governments have to do is deliver, and what young people, if they want to maintain this order that they have benefited from, and arguably take for granted, because they've never lived in anything else, is they actually have to go and be more activists about it. But I think where governments, think tanks and others can make a difference is actually go and talk about how globalization, how integration, 
how kind of having a more integrated culture is actually important for economies, jobs, and it's act how it's actually making a difference to people's lives, and in a good way. Thank you so much. Uh, Mariam Vidauri, uh, what would you say? Do you think uh, we got the question right on this one, or are the, uh, the fears overstated about this new age of nationalism from a, the vantage point of uh, the Americas? Thank you. Um, <coughs> yes, it's overstated uh, for the case of Latin America. Um, I think that the real issue is not, it doesn't go through the lens of nationalism. I think it goes through the lens of how efficient a democracy is and if it's delivering the goods or not for the people. As I view it, um, Latin America is the largest collection of democracies in the world. Uh, and this year, by the way, two out of three Latin Americans are going to the polls to vote. We have 15 elections, six presidential elections, including my country, Mexico, which I'll talk about later. Uh, not just not because it's my country and I like to brag, but but it's a it's a very important year for Mexico. It's at a crossroads. Brazil as well is electing a new president after several years of, of uh, economic crisis and also political crisis and total uh, uh, crisis of of um, legitimacy of the political class. And Colombia following the peace accords. So I think that we're, what we're facing right now, it's more of a crisis derived from the success of democracy because now citizens are empowered, not just by technology, which is uh, a, 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 a topic that my colleagues haven't mentioned, you know, the accessibility of smartphones and social media. People can voice their concerns. They have a more direct, they don't need political parties to, to voice uh, their concerns or channel their opinions. So they're more empowered. They expect more from politicians. They expect that politicians are flawless, which they're not. Nobody is. So by the very first mistake, politicians are out. So young people view that as a disincentive to participate in politics because the cost is super high of participating in terms of what you let go of uh, in terms of privacy. So the for Latin America right now, it's more of a question of not nationalism, but how democracy, the democratic states are responding to the ever ex excessive uh, societal uh, demands and expectations, and that is skewed. The state does not have that capacity. So as a result of that, we have dissatisfaction. Now, Latin America is not new. Um, populism is not new for Latin America. You are catching up, because we've had 100 years of populist uh, leaders. We even have categories of populists. Populism, classical populism with, with Perón and, and Vargas and, and our version, uh, Lázaro Cárdenas. Uh, we have neo-populists, we have economic populism. You, you got it, and we can make up more if you want. So you were saying also in terms of the, the use of concepts, right? And, 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 and with Rachel before, because I mean, we've been listening to so many bright ideas so, uh, the whole day. My brain is kind of, you know, uh, it's. Uh, uh, it's busy inside, <laughs> lots of <laughs> ideas. But we were saying, um, you know, it's, it's funny how he, we humans, we like to coin terms because it sort of like alleviates our anxiety. We need to know, that's, we're talking about the new world order, but it's been new for like the last two years, put, put a name on it. Like we, we seem like to, to like because it gives, a, gives us certainty. The matter is that we don't, we live in a world of, that's fluid and unpredictable. Um, and so, yes, we have experience in coining terms populism, but not, not really right now nationalism. It's the growing pains of being a democratic state, and we have the memory of the past of dictatorships um, in, 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 in the last three decades. I actually remember what it was like to live in an authoritarian regime. Um, and so, so it goes through the, through the coordinates of not age, not income, not class, but how effective and if it's delivering. Now, I, I would like to say that it's more, a, and, and, and I'm sorry, I'm saying not to use concepts, but then I'm gonna say a dichotomy that I think it's useful. And you see, you see things as you are, not as they are. So this is how I see things uh, from my perspective, is that we have two boxes. I love boxes, categories, frameworks. So one box is the, the pro-democracy camp 
the pro-human rights. We haven't talked much about human rights today overall in the panels, and I think it's key because it's principles. It's principles-driven policy, principles-driven regime. And we have actually, well, this year, it's 70 years of the Declaration of Human Rights. So, so it's an important year for that, to remember that, that there are norms. Um, and the other little box is the anti-democracy, anti-human rights. And that's the box where you have hate speech, where you have racism, where you have nativism. Now, uh, of course, although we don't have the issue of nationalism in Latin America, what the U.S. has experienced is triggering certain sentiments. Um, because when you say you're going to build a wall, even though the wall is not going to be physically, or maybe, I don't know, built, at least in the, in the mind of, of Latin Americans, you're already created a, a, a wall and divides and, and hampers the relationship between well, the U.S., which is a very important neighbor, and the rest of, uh, and Canada, of course, and the rest of the, of the continent. Um, I have to say something about the youth, because, so it's this panel is a mixture of themes. It's um, nationalism, uh, then the youth, and then also the bit of technology. So I would like to offer, uh, to end my, my, my um, initial remarks, by offering counterexamples. There was a premise in the, in the agenda and the explanation that said that youth uh, is to blame, or uh, the word blame is not used, but in my mind, I, I, uh, anyways, that it's because of the youth, you have a rise in nationalist and protectionist movements. And I would say that in the case of Latin America, at least for these following cases, it's, it's the contrary. Uh, in Guatemala, um, about three years ago, the, the talking about hashtags, like they, the young people say, I'm not a millennial, but, so, but that's what they do. <laughs> Renuncia ya, which means quit now, uh, was not the only factor, not the most important factor, but was a factor that led to the, aus uh, the not the ousting, but the resignation of a president. Um, in, in Guatemala, and actually they're both in jail, the president and the vice president now. Uh, other examples of hashtag movements, indignados in Honduras, which led to the installation of a special mission of the OAS, an anti-corruption mission that's still going on. Uh, Ni una menos in Argentina, yo soy 132 in Mexico, uh, and others. The problem is, um, so these are counterexamples, but the problem is that how do you, and this is going forward, how do we help or how do we support like, what's going on, the political developments in the virtual world to become actually proper formal institutions? Because you do need still political parties that are strong. Uh, you don't want personalistic vehicles that are just you know, to win power. You want accountability for after uh, people come to power. So all of these movements sort of were created uh, achieve a certain degree of, you know, the protest and, 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 and achieve the goals, but then they disappear. Um, so th that's a challenge. How do you transcend from the virtual to the, the real formal? And last but not least, I do have to mention the case of Venezuela because nobody has mentioned it today, and of course I'm biased because it's my region, but it's, it's remarkable that we're facing um, uh, a situation in that, li in that box that I told you, the pro and the anti, well, and the anti-human rights, that we have a case in, the, in 2017 of a dictatorship that basically last year uh, used uh, state repression um, against youth, against people who were protesting because they wanted uh, uh, democracy and they wanted uh, human rights and they wanted separation of powers. And, uh, and many of them die, many still die. And, and uh, some countries, some states have uh, denounced it, some haven't. So, so that's sort of like the brief panorama and the counterexamples, and I'm open to questions. Thank you so much. But before going to questions, uh, I'd like to hand the, the podium to Elena Lazaru, who's, uh, who works for the European Parliamentary Research Service. Elena, I'm sure uh, you have something positive to say of nationalism. Well, thank you. Um, in fact, I have a lot to say about nationalism, but uh, the way, let me say, the way I saw this question, and I'll try to, to not repeat what everyone else has said, because a lot of the things I wanted to say have already been mentioned, is as a tripartite question. So there were first the part about what is the youth doing? And I say, what is the youth doing? The question specifically mentioned nationalism, 
populism, uh, even radicalization and the tendency towards ISIS, for example. We see a lot of young people towards that. But what is the youth doing for the youth doing is for me a more general question than that. It's not just nationalism, populism, uh, radicalization. And the second question is, what of the liberal order? And, I, and the, the, the question was trying to draw a link between, are, we, uh, are the youth not inheriting or buying into the idea of liberal internationalism, of multilateralism? Uh, is that what we're seeing by a trend of youth uh, going towards more nationalist, populist ideologies? Um, and the third question was, how does the social media feed into this whole thing? How does the social media, media create the echo cha chambers which lead the youth towards this, this, uh, this direction? Now, my argument here is going to be that it's not exactly like that. I think the whole thing is a bit more nuanced. And there are three key points to this. The first is to understand more or less what is the youth, if we can think of a universal youth, looking for, and even try to draw some cross-regional perspectives, which I'll do in a minute by trying to compare the EU and Brazil, which are my fields of expertise. The second is, is the liberal order, or the liberal international order, as we older generations know it, what the youth is really thinking of, or do they see the world a bit differently? Because my sense is that these new ideologies that the youth is drifting towards offer a much more pick and mix version of the liberal order than what we're used to. And by what we're used to, I mean something that combines uh, you know, human rights, with an open economy, free trade, with the international institutions, and it's all one big pack. I think the options that the young people are going for today offer parts of that, not necessarily all of it a big parcel, but they go toward this pick and mix. Um, so for example, you'll see in Europe there are a number of young people who are in support of European integration, but anti-globalizers, which is a big paradox, but you'll see it very much, for example, in the people who voted for Syriza in Greece, which were overwhelmingly uh, young and overwhelmingly overwhelmingly pro-Europe, but very many of them from the anti-globalizer movement. <coughs> and the third facet, I think, is social media, which in my opinion is the means that a lot of the emerging political forces and politicians use to present views of the global or and national order, which are not necessarily the ones we know in our traditional boxes from political science, international relations, economic mm. theory. And oh, they have fantastic. both the language that the young people like, but also the vast spectrum of options uh, to offer that, that the youth is attracted to for many of the reasons that have been aforementioned, and most of all because they have not yet found uh, a, a sort of government which will respond to uh, perhaps even a utopian view of, of, of what they imagine the state to be like, which is very consistent with how we imagine the youth, you know, idealistic, looking for perfection. Someone said perfect here, and I think it's, it's one, you know, generally uh, underlying horizontal characteristic of the youth to look for that. Um, now, just to, just to just briefly understand what the youth is looking for, I think one has to look beyond populist and nationalist parties. Yes, there are also tendencies of the youth to flow towards those, more in some countries, less than others. Less so in countries like Brazil, for example, that have a very strong experience of populism, which is now considered even establishment. A populist leader in Latin America is not necessarily anti-establishment anymore. You've had them there for a long time. Um, so there are those. But if you look around the world, both in the EU and in Latin America, certainly, you see that uh, the young people, millennials, are also drifting towards other options, such as green parties, for example. Marina Silva, very popular in Brazil. In Austria, if you've seen the recent election, you know the. Uh, the young people voted very much for the Greens. Uh, and they also have a sense of um, disengaging what is the liberal international order from what each national party is necessarily selling to them. So I don't see it exactly as a direct link as we did previously. But a general sense of what the young people are feeling, and we definitely see that both in the EU and in Latin America, and Brazil specifically, for different reasons, is a sense of a lack of social contract. You know, a dissolution of what the agreement was between what they were expecting to be given by being part of a democratic s governed state and what they're getting. And this, of course, has largely to do with the individual economic circumstances in, in each country. And it's no surprise, for example, that I, I'll mention Greece again, but when a few years ago you had 50% youth unemployment, the young people either didn't vote or they were looking for something to vote for that had never been in government before. But I think that's hardly surprising. Um, and equally, we see tendencies in, in Brazil for young people not to vote because they were expecting to be given much more transparency, corruption, um, anti-corruption, and they're seeing the opposite. So to conclude, how do we uh, 
sort of tackle all of these problems because I'm running out of time. I think one thing we need to look for is how can governments harness globalization in a way that will offer their citizens what they need, uh, but without necessarily defaming international institutions if we assume this is the way we have to go. But also, international institutions should be adapting to the reality of what is needed now is for them to reach out directly to, to have a direct effect on improving citizens' life. Otherwise, it, they may well be called redundant, and rightly so. Um, I think schools have a really important role to play, education. I think everyone mentioned that in a way. Uh, not only in uh, civic education, but also in how to use social media. I th we haven't had time to talk about this, and I won't because I don't have time either, but I think this is really essential in understanding youth politics. And I will re leave it to this because I don't have any more time. Thank you, thank you, Elena. You brought up uh, some some really um, interesting questions that I think fit very well with the with the previous speakers. Uh, we're going to uh, go through the last of our panelists, uh, Julie Shesk, who's uh, the only practitioner on our panel. She's a global force planner at the Office of the Secretary of Defense of the United States, and uh, perhaps you would like to weigh in on your field of research, Asia, and perhaps offer some comments that also. Uh, touch upon the United States. Uh, thanks, Asla, and I just thanks everyone for attending and for the ORF for hosting this wonderful event. And I've learned a lot myself from all of the panels today and, of course, from my co-panelists here. Um, when Samir first contacted me about being on this panel, I was sort of like, is my only qualification my birth date that I am actually a millennial, and so that sort of qualifies me as a youth. I don't know that I can speak for the whole generation. Um, so I'll just speak for myself. Um, to go right to the heart of it, some of the questions that were asked, you know, from my perspective, I sort of disagree with Matt that it does feel generational, not necessarily in terms of the ideology, but in terms of our capacity to respond and what those solutions look like, right? So I'm a practical person, uh, and I guess I should say first that uh, None of what I'm about to say represents an official U.S. government position. I do not speak for the U.S. government. This is my own personal views. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, but I will say that the U.S. government, I think, has a serious role here. And obviously, as a member of that government, I'm interested in how we wield that role. Right? As Minister Swaraj said today, the role of government is to manage change. So to the extent that my fellow panelists have identified that there is a lot of change afoot and that there is disruptive activities and that maybe the youth are part of it or nationalism, whatever you want to call it, the root causes as they've identified, you know, this uh, sort of uninclusivity of the world that we live in now. And the fundamental premise, I think, of the liberal order is that inclusivity, which is everybody should have the opportunity to have the same rights, they should have the same opportunity to participate in the global economy, to receive the benefits of education, uh, modern technology, etc. right? And the deal is that government needs to facilitate that for the people. And where governments are failing to do that and provide opportunity, that's where you're seeing sort of upheaval. Um, for my own background, I focus on the Asia Pacific or the Indo-Pacific, whatever we're calling it now, um, which from my mind is the most critical region in the world in which to get this right and to make sure that folks understand the opportunities available to them and that their governments are doing the right thing by their people. Uh, and I think, again, the U.S. has a real role to play in this and which is why I've signed up to it. Um, something that has always attracted me to the Asia Pacific is the fundamental forward-looking optimism of people you meet in the region. It's a very young uh, region of the world, and it's a very, in my mind, American mentality of optimism. The future is going to be better than the past was, and I think that's pretty fundamentally different from other regions of the world where young people do not necessarily <laughs> believe that the future holds opportunity in the same way. Um, this highlights the importance of education, access to information, and certainly there are governments in the Asia Pacific that are better or worse at doing this. Um, there are a lot of examples as well of the ability of the youth to translate what that technology, education, access to information means for them, right? And you have places like the Philippines where if you step off the plane in Manila, it's incredibly dynamic. There are very educated young people who are on the phone all day with all parts of the world. And you have an opposite place where you know, in China, what was a lot of optimism about China's role in the world is kind of translated on the street to a sense of pessimism and sort of self-defensiveness about, well, nobody's letting us play the game. It's a big change, in my opinion, from when I lived there uh, a number of years ago. 
And all of this begs for leadership and management, and I think governments are the best place to provide that, and I think the question that was asked to this panel, what can young people do to participate in the global order and make sure that they inherit a liberal order that manifests those values that I think most people of this generation hold dear, is to actually participate. Right? It's nice to be part of the hashtag generation and say that I have all these values and me too and whatever else you want to talk about, but if you don't ever translate that into action, then who cares, right? What's the point? So as a practitioner, right, my whole job is to translate what we say as policy into actual tangible things on the ground, and I think it's extremely hard. So why do I say that it's a generational issue is that I think that the youth are not as burdened by the legacy of the past as some of the older practitioners that I've had the opportunity to work with and learn from are. For example, in working with China, you know, from a U.S. perspective, I think our policy has been pretty traditional. Some might say Cold War-esque, where we are at pains to say that we're not containing China, we're not, you know, in an adversarial relationship. I think that this doesn't really matter to people of my generation. When I talk to my colleagues in government at my level, everybody is open to creative solutions, inclusivity of China and world organizations, multipolarity, all this stuff we're talking about in all the panels. It's not really a debate that I've heard from people at my level and my generation in government, but I certainly have heard that from leadership. And I think that that capacity for innovative thinking, that ability to sort of slough off the legacy of the past is going to be very important and is why I think I'm hopeful that this activism and energy of uh, millennials and people of the hashtag generation can actually be translated into action. But you have to have trust in the institutions, you have to do it together and not alone. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Thank you very much. Uh, excellent, uh, excellent presentations. Uh, I think that you topic you covered a lot of uh, topics from from various angles and uh, and spanned most of the globe as well. Um, before going to uh, to questions from the audience, and uh, you can all prepare your sharpest and most uh, uh, intelligent questions, if you will. Um, what what I come away with is that uh, the, the panelists seem to all agree that uh, leaders around the world are facing a uh, restless uh, electorate, impatient electorate. Um, uh, the established order is being re re uh, reforged and, uh, and is under pressure. And this pressure is uh, to uh, some extent, uh, at least is coming from the electorate. Uh, and the panel seems to agree either that some of these uh, gripes are in indeed valid, even if uh, the, um, the concept of of nationalism or populism or uh, uh, might not be the, the shoe that fits. It's certainly not uh, on a global scale. Uh, and uh, the panel also seems to agree that uh, uh, the leaders, most like all leaders at all times, uh, respond effectively to the challenges of their day or they'll be in a lot of trouble. Uh, that brings us to one topic that, uh, that Elena kindly, kindly raised in her presentation and which I would like for the rest of you to weigh in on, would you Elena? This is the question of social media, which is in some ways sort of a, the, snake in the, uh, the snake in the room, if you will, where uh, we see that uh, social media is transforming politics and some people, a lot of people, are concerned that uh, it's not entirely beneficial and that it, it's making uh, the, the anonymity of the internet and the rise of so-called fake news is, um, is, is racing ahead of the leader's ability to get ahead of the, of the, of, of the troubles that are, are causing the concerns, if you, if you catch my drift. Matt, will you say a couple of words on that? Um, I can, it's, it's a very important phenomenon. It's, it's inherently, I like to say that, I, so before I, I went to law school, my first education was history. And I love the idea that history is cyclical. The one area where it's not cyclical is technology. Technology really, really changes. And so inherently, because social media is, is really technology driven, it, it's very hard to predict or even to sort of wrap your arms around. But in, in the area of the world that I study in Russia, there's one really interesting wide open question, which is it has been the case for 26 years that Russians have enjoyed very significant freedom in private communication. So much more so than in Soviet times, for example. You don't have to turn on the faucet and speak in the kitchen, whatever. You can say whatever you want. And that traditionally in the last 26 years applied 
to the internet, where you can say what you want to your friends, etc. But they didn't have total freedom in political public speech. And so the thing about social media is suddenly private speech, when you say something you think it's to your friends, it can get 10,000 likes and it can become a phenomenon of public speech. And we don't know really what that means yet. And I think that there are not only problems, for, in, for example, for Russia in this, I think there are problems for a lot of societies that think they have a handle on what social media means for politics and may find out they really, really don't. I mean, social media is a good example of what you talked about in your introduction of kind of uh, uh, a, a, a kind of a technology that can have very opposite impacts. On the one hand, social media, this is this generation of millennials is more connected across the world than anybody has been in the past. It is helping them connect with people across the world on issues of common interest, etc. The flip side is uh, it is also helping create the echo chamber because you can find people people who only agree with you. And this is not a, and, and, and this is coming at a time when, where the generational thing it'll be interesting to see, which is, do you learn how to actually debate civilly on differences, rather than just say, I'm gonna sit back on my position and not actually have to sit down and figure out a compromise and learn how to, that you don't need to do these things. Um, and so I think this is where we don't have a neat answer because we haven't seen this play out yet. So it's not fundamentally good or fundamentally bad, but I think we will be having these discussions because they, have, they can have such uh, opposite impacts. Having said that, it can be used um, very constructively as well um, for governments uh, to actually get young people a active. We've seen this in, in India, but we've also seen kind of you know, political parties in India use it um, also to kind of rile up uh, their, their bases. So I think it's, it, it can be very different. Um, yeah, I think we're, we're the impact of social media in politics and in democracy, I mean, we, we're, we haven't figured it out, that's why it's a question. Um, certainly many actors have to be involved. I, I read recently that there's a proposal for generating a Geneva Digital Convention to protect citizens from uh, cyber attacks and so it's, 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 it's sort of translating what you have in the formal institutions world into the virtual world. But it's still, I mean, it's, it's the jury is still out and, and, and we're, we're basically just, um, we have identified the stakeholders that have to be involved in that discussion, the, the technology, uh, the big companies, Google, Facebook, et cetera, uh, Twitter, of course, citizens, governments, private sector, but how we're gonna do that, uh, what the, the, the rules of the game are in that area that it's not governed by one sole entity, it's basically the power is highly distributed. Uh, one can have the power uh, uh, of, of, of many. Um, it's, it's very difficult. I wanna mention as a case, not to, to just say general <coughs> comments, but actually talk about a specific case. So I mentioned uh, that this year we have elections in Mexico. Um, so I wonder, I mean, this is, there's no way to prove it, uh, but I wonder how, how would the election turn out without the input of social media? Will it still be the, the front runner AMLO, uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, which is sort of like the outsider, although he comes from a, a, a political party, but he's running on that platform that he's not like the rest of the politicians that are corrupt from the traditional parties. Um, really, I mean, he's the front runner and, and the election is his to lose. And so the social media, what it does is just augment the reality. It's a mirror of the structural problems that Mexico has coupled for, for many, many decades. I mean, and not just Mexico, the rest of Latin America, we are the most violent region in the world. Uh, nine out of the 10 most violent cities are in, in the Americas because there is one in, 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 U in the US. Um, and uh, we're also the most unequal region. So we don't really need <laughs> more help, you know, like it just augments the situation, the social media. Uh, but we have issues that so far the system, the establishment hasn't efficiently or as fast uh, responded to, again, uh, meet the demands of the, of the restless and, and uh, society with very high expectations. And I mean, I see, I, I must mention this, this example. When I was in one of the panels today, I, in, in like five minutes, I got six texts from uh, the iCloud. My six-year-old son 
was sending me requests for approval because he wanted to buy apps. And I, <laughs> I have a lock in the iPad uh, because then he will buy things. Like, <laughs> there is no end. The instant gratification that they're used to. And I wonder, that is, first of all, he doesn't say, hi, good morning, mom. He just sends a request. <laughs> like, it's, he, he expects this, he, 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 he has earned it. He, you know, he expects me to say, yes, I approve, $4, $2, dollars, dollars, no way. But uh, I wonder, this is how he's like wired. It's just the thumb, and he knows exactly what to do. So how is he gonna communicate uh, with his classmates as he's growing up? How is he gonna communicate in his community? If I don't even know, like in 10 years, you know, we've had Facebook, Twitter, and all of that. I can't imagine how it will be in the next 10 years. How, who, who, how will Felipe, my son, choose his president? Or, or on the basis of like what criteria will he choose? I don't know, it's just completely different. We're running out of time. Sorry. Um, to take off of that, I guess everybody's mentioned the concerns about the echo chamber and whether or not it allows for nuanced thinking and understanding. I would also argue that um, something that Elena brought up, younger generations also have less of an expectation of privacy. They've been sharing their lives online you know, for their whole lives. And so I think that the cost actually to entering into political activism or sharing your opinions more publicly than previous generations did is lower. And I hope that that's something that can be marshaled to move people from sort of that reflexive uh, opinion making to actually doing something about it. Because the internet also offers a lot of information, global connectivity and connecting you with groups that can actually help you turn your ideas into reality from a business community standpoint and as well in the political sphere. So uh, again, I, I agree with everyone. The impact isn't known, but I think there's a lot of cause for optimism as much as there is the, the negative eventualities. And then uh, you'll, you'll pass up on this one. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have about 11 minutes to go, and I have eight people on my speakers <laughs> list. So uh, this, is, this is going to be a stretch. So, but uh, I think we might be able to pull, uh, pull this miracle off if uh, if you state your name uh, and your affiliation and you ask one question, no statement, uh, that, that would be helpful. And we have the first question here, sir. Uh, uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, my name is Peter Tobishkano from uh, IMMO, uh, Mos uh, Russian Academy of Sciences and CP Stockholm based institute. The question is, uh, if to compare uh, two situations in the Cold War time, uh, the situation of hot peace, what is in view? Uh, is it more stable, uh, more predictable, or less predictable, or less stable? Or what is your uh, view on development of this situation? Back to cold peace or uh, uh, forward to hot war? Thank you so much. <laughs> Sir? I'm Georgi Teleraya, uh, Moscow Institute of International Relations. I'm a professor and being a professor, I We were talking about protectionism and nationalism, and I, I've got a simple question uh, to all panelists. What do you think is more important, nation state or human rights? And which come first? And can one exist uh, without another, human rights without nation state or nation state without human rights? <laughs> <laughs> I like you. Uh, <laughs> Thank you very much. My name is Fyodor Wojtolovsky. I'm from IMMO, Institute of the World Economy and Ro of Russian Academy of Sciences. <laughs> uh, I've got a question to, to, to Matt Rozhansky. You know, uh, uh, taking into account the topic of uh, the discussion call from the Cold War to hot peace. Now, uh, Cold War as a political phenomena, as military political phenomena, caused serious changes in the psychology of several generations of Americans and Soviets on both sides, in the Western camp and Eastern camp. It's, it transformed their political elite, its way of thinking, its way of, uh, you know, uh, yeah, perceiving reality. So uh, if we're entering to the more competitive, but at the same time more interdependent hot peace, how it could change the psychology of uh, the current and next generations of decision makers 
and what could be the main features? Thank you. Well, coming from Norway with Russia uh, at our uh, as our closest neighbor, I uh, I have no choice but to give uh, the floor to the fourth of the Russians, <laughs> uh, and, and we will and we will get the Russian questions out of the way, and then we will answer the questions. The, the, we will answer the Russian questions, and then we will have four more questions, sir. Thank you, Mike. Yeah, thank you, ve thank you very much. Well, <laughs> it was a great panel. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it was a really, introduce really great panel. My wa only one introduce question to Julie will be, can you summarize your intervention into just two sentences? Because my English is so poor <laughs> that I couldn't understand anything uh, of the point uh, from your intervention. So can you make it shorter, like two, two sentences? My question to Marianne is why do you think Mexico is so relatively not so successful? What are the major factors that your country is for already 100 of years is struggling? Neighborhood? Bad, bad neighborhood? <laughs> Good neighborhood? <laughs> Internal structural factors? What, what, what is the primarily reason? Mm -hmm. And my, my last question goes to Matt Rajansky. Matt, uh, hot Cold War and hot peace, do you think it is everywhere or just between Russia and the West? Or it is within both Russia and the West and within both international community? We had a Cold War and now we have a hot peace. Thank you. Wonderful. This is, uh, this is turning into a bit of a bloodbath for the panel because uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to hand this to the panel and uh, Elna, you're first and answer the ones that you feel inclined to answer and, and I would like for all the questions to be addressed. First of all, thank you. I think I'm going to leave this panel learning a lot about Russia, <laughs> um, <laughs> which is not my field at all. Um, secondly, um, to the question about what is less dangerous, hot peace versus cold war. I don't have an answer, but I definitely think hot peace, which I like to refer to as the mess, uh, is more unpredictable. And I have to say, for me, between Cold War and Hot Peace, there is a very tiny little period of time which one could generally refer to as peace in spite of several regional conflicts. But there was a time during, I don't know, the end, between the end of the Cold War and the beginning of the mess, or Hot Peace, that felt like, for a second there, it was both predictable and predictably peaceful for most parts of the world, or at least there was a sense of knowing where the power li li lay who would intervene and what more or less we were going towards. Um, and the hot peace is unpredictable, that's, that's, that's for sure. I think during the Cold War there was one or two or three possible, you, can, you could build a scenario, you know, and we've seen this in various crises during the Cold War. You could more, one state or another would know more or less wh who its allies were. And within states, um, I would say there were more consolidated uh, consensus, uh, there was more consolidated consensus of what this pr a particular nation state was going to because the external environment was so much, um, you know, restrictive. So, so there was kind of all these elements of predictability. I think hot peace is much more unpredictable on many levels. Um, internationally, we really, I don't think we've come yet to a point where we can say the balance of power has been reshuffled and now we know more or less how it is. We, we saw the BRICS, now the BRICS are going back, but there's China, and no one really knows where is the real center of the balance of power. We don't know what's happening within states because there's an internal struggle between the haves, the have-nots, um, <laughs> democratic, more democratic, more authoritarian, and we have all this social media technology interconnectivity that has its own dynamic. So I think hot peace is really a big unpredictability. If that you think is more dangerous than the Cold War, I leave it to you. Um, and about the question on nation states or human rights, million dollar question for a long time. Um, I will evade it happily by <laughs> getting back to a point that I wanted to make before, but due to time I didn't, which is what I said about pick and mix, but I didn't have time to elaborate. I think the dilemma of nation state versus human rights is one of many that a lot of politicians are now trying to circumvent by using what is now social media for and, and attracting the youth by doing so because 
they no longer posit this as an either or question. So you'll see by using Twitter, since you don't have to have a party manifesto or a so serious pre-electoral agenda, <coughs> a certain politician may say, oh, I, I, he that may proclaim to be very nationalist, but at the same time on another occasion they might say, I am the biggest human rights defender and I support this, but I don't support that. And I'm, you know, there's so many things a politician can say on Twitter that previously we would have thought would be an either or question. But now no one questions it because it's on Twitter and it's going fast. And, and so the youth is being drawn to this offer that is all encompassing of things that potentially could not be reconciled in reality. So no one's trying to reply this question, I think, exactly so on Twitter. Um, for Timofei, I guess, first, I would say my main point was that actually translating energy and activism into action and tangible results is really hard, and maybe the youth are not as inclined to do that, but if they want to inherit anything, they're going to have to, and so I think there's a role in there for stepping up and into a managerial position like uh, the role of the government or other organizations. Um, to kind of the slew of questions about Cold War hot peace, I agree with Elena that hot peace is more unpredictable, but fundamentally isn't the outcome the same, right? Lots of people are dying, there's lots of mass migration, there's economic instability, and we're unclear about how those relationships all work together. And I think it's still probably existential. While it seemed more predictable in the Cold War, you had very diametrically opposed sides, we still have those sides, right? Um, and this gets to, I guess, the professor's question about nation states versus human rights. I don't I guess agree with Elena that this is a, a hard question to answer. Certainly there are nation states that don't offer human rights. They exist. But are they stable? Are they successful? Are they sustainable? I, I would argue that from an American perspective, we've seen a challenge to our institutions and the institutions have come back roaring. And I think that there are nation states out there that don't offer their people human rights and they're fundamentally unstable. And I think there's an insecurity that comes with that. and so. If you want to characterize that as, you know, we're going to come into a new Cold War because these are the fundamental values that people want, that's fine. But I think it's human nature. People want to participate in their own destiny. And if you don't offer them a way to do that, that's real, that's not a fig leaf of participation, then you're going to be insecure in the long term. That's too good. Okay. Um, this is why I love coming here, because it's so easy when you're in your bubble, because <laughs> you already know what to expect <laughs> and what to say. Um, and here, uh, at the Raisina and with the Observer Research Foundation, you always stress test your knowledge. So I like it, it's a challenge. So bring it. Uh, what is your name again? Timofe. Timofe? Okay. Like Tim? Yeah. Okay, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, okay, let's, let's do this, okay. So first of all, <laughs> like, like I mentioned before, you see things as you are, not as they are. Your question is biased by saying that Mexico is not successful. So first you have to basically say why not. We're part of the OECD, I don't know Russia, if Russia is part of the OECD. <laughs> um, we've done lots of structural reforms. Well, not we, I'm not part of the government, but the, the country has, poverty has decreased. We still have a problem with inequality, of course. There, we are a big country, a federal country, where states, governors are elected democratically, so they have their own jurisdiction. So there are differences within them, Mexico. You can say that the different levels of income inequality, of course, more in the south, it's, it's poorer, and, and of course, uh, uh, the Gini north. Gini coefficient. The Gini coefficient, exactly. And you can also argue that there are different levels of democraticness, uh, like Guillermo Dano coined the term. Um, where there are pockets, you know, of rule of law that are not there, like, uh, you know, the killings of the, of the teachers uh, in Guerrero. Um, there are still many problems in terms of human rights violations, um, and of course we have crime organization, it's not, it's not easy. But if you compare, you can argue when, when you're, I, I don't know, I think, uh, to say that something's better or worse, you have to either compare it to something else, or to yourself in another period of time. I think that Mexico has come a long way in the last 30 years. Uh, we've been through a terrible crisis before you guys were in crisis in Russia in the late 90s. We had first the tequila crisis and that provided a lot of, uh, an opportunity to create reform in the financial institutions. So now we have a pretty solid, I think. Um, uh, and, and growth is gonna be great this year. 
and we're going to the World Cup in Russia, so, so it's awesome. Uh, also in terms of... And? and you hope to win. We always hope to win, uh, but I don't know. See, we, we went there on Yeah. No, we at least hope. Yeah. Um, <laughs> in terms of, so that's. You're not, you're, uh, all of you, 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 you be structured. You know, like I say, you're, you're, <laughs> co you're causing the Norwegian pain. I'm already having a really uh, rapid heartbeat of the but prospect of going over time. So Are you having fun? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, okay, good. So, in terms of political rights and civil liberties, we have also come a long way. We have. Um, uh, equidad de género, uh, gender equality in Congress, for instance, gay rights, uh, and, and so, I mean, we, we have enfranchised a large parts of the world. So, I don't know, your question is biased and I would argue against it, of course. Um, and also in terms of the neighborhood, that's also a key thing, you know, you, I'm not gonna take the bait, I'm just gonna say that uh, I love where I'm from. There are no wars in our continent, uh, officially, now. Uh, no interventions. Uh, and we have different, you know, kinds of governments, and it's a it's a community with problems, but a community of democracies nonetheless. And professor, your question is very, very. Uh, of course, uh, um, he's gonna kill me if I start. But but uh, I I don't know why it's even why is it a question why it's an either or. Uh, and also with uh, in the UN Charter and like the Declaration of Human Rights. I mean, you, we already have international norms that mention explicitly mm -hmm. the protection of human rights. So I don't even know why, why, why it could be in contradiction, uh, theoretically speaking. Yeah, pragmatically, it's another thing. Yeah. No. Sorry. I say, I'm a law and order guy. I'll follow your instructions. <laughs> Number one, uh, Pyotr and Pyotr. Uh, <laughs> just as, as straightforward as I can. Uh, I think the difference in psychology and the difference in stability <laughs> is the same thing. Uh, in the Cold War, you had lots of fear, but it was rational fear. You understood the framework within which you needed to be afraid and what you needed to do to reduce the likelihood that the bad thing would happen. Today, there is just as much fear, maybe more, but it's irrational. It's not within any kind of framework that can be managed, and that tends to result in more instability. That's, that's my concern, and it changes the psychology of people who experience it. Second, Professor Talaraya, um, let me give you the lawyer's answer, and that is, well, there is such a thing as a universal declaration of human rights, isn't there? And it's also been signed up to by nearly every nation state in existence, and it talks about individuals, not about states, and yet, do you know what one of the rights enshrined in the universal declaration is? The right not to be made stateless. So it's an imponderable, just like your question. Um, and, and third, uh, Timofey, uh, you know, Timofey is gone, so, yeah. oh, okay, all right. <laughs> so you can't ask questions like that and leave. Um, you know, is it, is it still, just as it was, overwhelmingly about Russia and the West, or Russia and the United States? So my feeling is, you're Russian, you tell me if I'm wrong, but my feeling is for Russia, it's more or less about as much about the United States and the West today as it always was, but I think for the United States, it is less about Russia than it was in the 80s, and much more about Russia than it was in the 90s. I will make two points. Uh, one, if you think the ideas of a hot peace are just a Europe West thing, uh, watch this space in Asia. You have, you have not in history had two countries neighboring each other. It's not just one country rising here. It is two countries, if not multiple, including if you uh, I include Japan, two countries of this size rising at the same time plus more, who think of themselves as re-emerging powers, civilizational powers, and who still have, as government, something to prove to their publics, who are increasingly becoming vocal in true nationalism, uh, through social media, becoming prouder, more confident. That can go out different ways. And my second point is uh, the death of globalization is greatly exaggerated, because where else uh, would you see, kind of, in India, uh, Mexicans and Russians arguing about uh, pretty much everything under the sun. <laughs> so, uh, what a great panel, eh? Ladies and gentlemen, we're going to do it this way. I'm going to make you an offer I hope you will refuse. Let's take, <laughs> let's take 30 seconds. Those of you who want to leave, you leave now. Otherwise, you're locked in with us. The bar, and for the rest of you, the bar is still open and you're welcome to go and charge your glasses. I'll give you 30 seconds because I intend to take this panel 15 minutes over the time, and uh, damn the consequences back in Norway. <laughs> well, uh, well uh, no, uh, the first question is, 
over there. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. So the first question comes from Norway this time. Um, <laughs> My name is Helen Foyne. Uh, I'm one of the Raisina Young Fellows. So by Samir's definition, still young for another 11 months or so. Um, thank you very much for an interesting panel. You've touched upon this issue of instant gratification, which is a big issue in our times. But there's also an issue of very short attention span, as far as I have heard over the last few days and that I'm gathering. And um, Marianne, you sort of touched upon it. But can either Mariano or Tanvi respond to the question of how can politicians and policymakers um, communicate all of these difficult issues that we're dealing with and solutions to them and what they would like to do for a country, a nation state or global institutions in an age where the attention span of large parts of the population has diminished to such a drastic degree as I see it? And secondly, what should our education institutions focus on in this time and age? To um, well, to help us with that communication in the times to come. Thank you. And we have some more questions. Well, it's it's actually more of pondering, and I want to ask what you think about it. Thank you, by the way, for all your opinions. Um, it strikes me that in this hot piece that we uh, that we are all in at the moment, everywhere, uh, a lot of models of statecraft are actually implicitly held to the light. And I think that Russia and China, for instance, have a different social contract with their people than, for instance, a country such as the United States. Um, like, for instance, I think that in the United States, the contract is that is if the government makes sure that the, the individual is free to pursue the good life in his or her own opinion, that's enough of a job. While in countries such as Russia and China, I think there's more of a contract that the government is actually obliged to take care of the good life. That is what I understood from my discussion with Chinese people. So I see the same thing played out in the definition of development as freedom by Amartya Sen. You have the freedom from, and you have the freedom to. So actually, you're playing it out as an opposition, but it should actually always go together. Because what is the freedom from worth if you don't have the freedom to. And I think, by the way, that might also be implicitly and unconsciously the response of a lot of the young millennials who can't pay their study debt in the United States. Yeah, they're free to make debt. They don't have the freedom to be free from debt. But the was there a question there? Yeah, so what do you think about that idea? Okay. That, that, <laughs> actually <laughs> those, that actually those concepts are being played out, like the different scenarios. Maybe this actually, the nationalism is a critique on the liberal order. Thank you. I'm, I, I love the reference to Amartya Sen, so uh, I'll, get, I'll let you get away with the statement. And then from the Serbian delegation. And please introduce yourself, yeah. sir. Uh, Marko Sarkovic from Belgrade, Marko Sarkovic from Belgrade Security Forum. Very short question for Elena Lazaru uh, on the pick and mix uh, approach utilized by young people. Uh, what does this mean for established political parties. for a while now about uh, disruptive transitions, but I'm still not sure, do we see disruption as a positive or a negative in this context? Because certainly <laughs> it can be both, and creative destruction can be a force for change that can lead to innovation in new and interesting ways. And on the theme of being a little bit provocative as we continue the panel, talking a lot about the liberal order, the international order, doesn't seem to be a lot of consensus on what that has meant historically or means now. And uh, to raise the question, if we were and certainly some leg legitimate critiques about whether both national and international institutions are inclusive and fulfilling social contracts. If we were starting from scratch in the world we live in now and trying to de design new paradigms or institutions, what might those look like and how would they be different from what we have now? And how might technology factor in? And I'm curious to hear your thoughts if we were sort of trying to look beyond the order we have now and think about new options that would hopefully manage some of these transitions? Can we ho hopefully put things in a more positive light on that front, so. Thank you, and then the final question. All right, hi, my name is Yao Zhang. Um, I'm just from the audience. Um, uh, I'm a uh, tech entrepreneur from Silicon Valley in robotics. Um, 
um, born in China and then been studying and working and living in the U.S. So my question, very specific, for, because you know many of you are great minds studying geopolitical and, and also you know the combination with tech, tech's impact on um, you know the, the world order or trend. Um, I'm curious about what's your opinion about North Korea because I haven't been hearing about it, and they have a very young leader, Western educated. And then there are many, many people, you know, growing up there, right, who probably don't have the same technological access to information. So there are millennials, even younger people. What, what should we, how should we think about it, facing all the many upcoming potential things? Thank you so much. I think that we will um, uh, give the, the speakers a chance to give a, take a run at all of those questions, and this time we will do it in. There's a, there's a question back there. It's a, it's a Oh, sorry, I, did, I didn't see you. The, then one more question. There is a, pa there is a microphone on the table. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Lucy Shule. I'm from Tanzania. It's just a minor question. In the whole debate that we've been having this uh, tonight on youth, nationalism, and globalization, uh, any panelists can address how, where do we place patriotism? Does it still play a role? or something that we should not consider at the moment? Thank you. That's a great question. Thank you so much for asking it. Uh, we would be amiss if it wasn't asked. Um, I will give the, the floor back to the, to the panelists this time in reverse order from the starting lineup. That means you are up first, Julie. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I guess to take Helen's question on attention span, uh, I had to write all this down because, of course, all of us have a diminished attention span, but uh, my education focused a lot on analysis, and I still think that's the right way to go. And again, that depends on somewhat of a free and open society where you have actual debate, you have access to real resources that are factual, right? not this echo chamber that people are in, and the desire to get out of that, I hope, is still the mission of, of most universities, and I think as long as they continue to do a good job, uh, we should be okay. Um, I'll probably skip through a bunch of the other questions and just go to the patriotism question, which Lucy, I'm glad you asked. Um, I was sort of joking before the panel, but it's not really a joke, right? Like, why do you work for your own government? Because you're a patriot. <laughs> um, and I like to use, I think, patriotism more so than nationalism because nationalism gets a bad rap, yeah. right? But as a patriot, do I fundamentally believe that the US has a model for the world that is good for people in the world? Yes. Do I want to contribute to expanding that model and winning more adherence to it than we already have? Absolutely. That's why I do this job. Um, so I think patriotism is a good thing if you think that your ideas uh, have merit. But you have to be willing, as Matt said, to have a real debate about them and to see who wins out. And I think the answer is quite clear these days, even though people want to talk about uncertainty, unpredictability. You know, states like North Korea are failing for a very clear reason. They don't offer any opportunities to their people. So as much as they've controlled all of the information, as much as they're controlling freedom of movement, as much as they're controlling, you know, what the narrative is, I don't think they're sustainable. And I think that history has shown that. So. Thank you. I'll, I'll take the question that was addressed directly to me, which is what should established parties do, given the fact that there are all these emerging parties that offer various options? Well, very honestly, and I think for most parts of the world that are experiencing these phenomena, established parties are going through a very serious Darwinist phase. You know, it's either adapt and evolve or perish. And, and we see that, you know, in many of the social democratic parties in Europe, uh, we see... Um, We've seen, um, you know, the Democrats in the U.S. are going through a really big search of what to do next. And we also see the ones that I think are somehow evolving. Uh, I don't know what the end result will be, but I mean, who would have thought that a uh, CDU uh, chancellor in Germany would open the doors of immigration? And who would have thought that um, a extreme left government in Greece would sign m numbers of memoranda uh, on austerity and who would have thought we're seeing conservative governments uh, 
sign in laws for gay marriage. We're seeing a lot of adaptation to the fact that it's not like the lines between left and right are not where they were for the new generation. And I think established parties are adapting, and those who are not are facing a really serious problem in finding the right electorate. Uh, the other thing, of course, that they're doing, and I think they're learning from the newcomers. Uh, we see the language changing very much in, in a lot of the ways that traditional established parties communicate. They're using social media, simpler language. And of course, one very important thing is, unfortunately because, fortunately or unfortunately actually, but since the new generation looks for the new generation, young faces, new leaders, and, and we're seeing that. We're seeing it in Austria, we're seeing it in Argentina, we're seeing it uh, in France, uh, we're seeing it in a number of places. And I'm sorry for having a bit of a Europe, America's centered approach, but I, I, as far as I know, it's happening elsewhere too. It's just my field of expertise. One note on the issue of disruption and the liberal order. I think we should have expected what's happening now because the liberal, what we refer to as the liberal international order is very much a transatlantic thing and the world was not going to remain that for too long. And in many ways, I'm afraid we may have missed a good moment because at the time when the BRICS were really a thing, it was a really good time to reform the international institutions more. Uh, and I think it was a good time. Uh, I mean, the emerging powers were more, more trusting on how this international order could accommodate them than we ha have seen now. So I'm sure th the international institutions are going to evolve through this crisis, but I think it will take a lot of ups and downs until we have the right balance. I think the wine has made me like sleepy, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> so I'll be brief. Uh, your question. I think uh, the problem is that a lot of politicians are finding ways how to tackle that new audience that it has a short attention span and like instant gratification. So they cater to that, and so you know people that run on personalistic vehicles or you know small parties, and they base their whole platform on themselves and their egos uh, and you know they they make good use of this and they know exactly what to say um, they're the ones getting into power uh, the traditional el political elites are using more language of the previous century but having said that uh, in Latin America we've been and I don't mean this in a mean way but recycling presidents I mean they just won't let go of power they come back again and again. I mean, we had Alan Garcia in Peru again. Uh, Piñera's again president in Chile. I mean, Macri is the new president in, in Argentina. He's a different, he's not Kirchner, he's not from the other tradition, uh, traditional party. But, but still, it's not like a new, uh, a young, new uh, generation. Uh, in Mexico, the, the front runner is basically a, a guy who's lost twice presidential elections and comes from traditional parties. And in Central America, you see the, the rise of outsiders. Uh, in Costa Rica next month, they're going to have, in less than two weeks, they're going to have presidential elections. The front runner is an outsider, not from the, the traditional. But he's not, he's not young, he's older. So in a way, I mean, they're not opening spaces to, I feel. That's only my, my sleepy perception right now. Uh, what else? Um, North Korea, I, I really am not an expert. <laughs> And if I speak right now, I'm going to get into trouble. <laughs> uh, the only thing I can say is they have, they have nuclear weapons, so that we'll have to pay attention. Uh, that's, that's how, <laughs> how, at least from Latin America, we view it as they have that power. So, uh, But it's remarkable that that sort of regimes, like in Cuba, for instance, still, still exist and, and, and are sustained. Um, and, uh, and your question, I don't remember your name, about the new liberal order, and if we could start from scratch, I would give those people who are starting from scratch, like different books, probably Machiavelli, <laughs> but also something about Buddha to be relaxed and to think and be patient and, and, and draft policy, not reactively, but proactively, um, and, and, and take into consideration that we live in a globalized world. Uh, so that ties into the pa patriotism. I like patriotism, of course. I, like, uh, I love my country, and even if I've been away for so long, um, it's it's incredible, and not because I'm a so super soccer fan, but here you go. I mean, soccer, mariachi, tacos. I mean, there's nothing that can blur uh, class, in, uh, education. We're all the same when you when you touch those topics. But at the same time, you cannot resist. We live in a globalized world, irreversibly so. 
so so Would we're also yeah so so we're part of this community so we have to mind others because everything intermestic what happens internationally also affects domestically eventually and that's all because of me and then uh, Matt. So I would say on kind of the educational, because I think that is crucial, I think two things. <laughs> One, I think in terms of education, just because we don't even know what is going to be relevant in terms of substance two years from now, is I think educational institutions have to teach people, going to Julie's point, analysis, essentially not what to think, but how to think, because you don't know what the issues are going to be. Second, I think the art of debating needs to be brought back. There's too much kind of, we, you know, I'm sorry to say this, but the kind of snowflakey thing, we can't argue about these things. We can't mention this is going to offend somebody. You have to be able to debate and debate civilly without calling the other person anti-national um, or kind of unpatriotic. Um, second, on kind of how do you get policymakers to actually, how do policymakers that kind of get young people? I think they will not listen to young people if young people don't get out and vote. They will not care. Why do they go and older people vote and so they cater to their needs? So go out and vote. I would say the other thing is go run for office, become policymakers, run for office, go serve in government. And today policymakers aren't just people in government, right? It's business, it's civil society. And I think that large group of stakeholders that is actually invested, business, government, etc., state governments, which need globalization for various reasons, they actually have to go and make the case in terms that young people will understand, and it has to, they have to make it work for young people. But it also means doing things like funding networks for, for the kind of things you're doing, you know, bringing people together, funding study abroad programs for people who can't do it, kind of getting people to engage in these issues, but making the case, why does this matter to your life? But it can't be just left to kind of policymakers uh, you know, as Julie said, I think very well, young people have to take responsibility too. I think part of the problem is you take it for granted you've always had this world. I mean, I always say this, I grew up in socialist India, you want me to find me vo voting for Bernie Sanders, because uh, I know what that's like. So, you know, it's just not to become political, but I think this is, you have to kind of make the case. Um, finally, on uh, the question of kind of uh, nationalism, I think it's absolutely true that, I mean, I, I think I said, Nationalism can be good or it can be bad. It's about what kind of it and how leaders ch channel it as well. And so I do think kind of the patriotism, absolutely. I think, you know, that is why nation states do still matter. It can be a really good thing, but it has to be channeled properly and not be used. It, if it started to be defined not as I am a proud nation, but I am against somebody, that's when you get into trouble. Um, again, and, and, and now I recognize I should con form with the Norwegian expectation to end on time. Uh, so three quick points. Elsa, on what is stability about? Is it, is it positive or negative? I think the, the positive kind of stability is essentially the freedom to fail with manageable consequences. So in the economy, it's the freedom to sort of declare bankruptcy and move on to another uh, you know, venture. Uh, and, and not be run out of town on a rail. In, in politics, it's the freedom to lose an election and not have to fear for your life or your, or your freedom or your safety. Uh, e even in family life, right? Families sometimes fail, couples fail, you know, whatever it is, the abuse, et cetera. So the, the freedom that people can fail at things, but that there are still some basics that are stable and predictable. And that tends to give, it tends to take away the fear that drives uh, the worst kinds of outcomes in society. On North Korea, Ms. Yao, the one thing, I, I thought your question was great because it touched on access to information, which is one of the few things uh, in our 21st century interconnected globalized world that's really different about North Korea. And all I can suggest is if you, uh, you're in Silicon Valley, so there's an author at Stanford called Adam Johnson who wrote The Orphan Master's Son. Uh, it has a tiger on the cover. If you haven't read it, you should read it. It will tell you a lot about that question. Um, and the third, uh, on patriotism, Lucy, I think it was. Um, so I don't know exactly what patriotism means, but I think it's a companion idea in the sense that you, you almost never do anything solely because of patriotism, speaking, speaking to, to you, Julie, as well. I don't disagree with you, but I think it's patriotism and. So it's patriotism and uh, survival, patriotism and freedom, patriotism and ambition, patriotism and hunger, patriotism and greed. Right, but but it tends to be a companion idea. It doesn't really mean a whole lot solely on its own. 
Wonderful. We have uh, gone a little bit over the time, but I do think it was worth it. Please join me in a big round of applause for this panel.